I'm uh, fortunate uh, this afternoon uh, to have uh, uh, Dr. Adnan Shihab Eldon as our uh, speaker. Um, uh, Adnan has been a friend of the Kennedy School for many years. I think I met you about eight years ago, I think. Um, he's had a, and he's had a remarkable career in academia and government and in some of the most um, uh, prominent multinational uh, institutions. Uh, he is presently the uh, Director General of the Kuwait Foundation for the Advancement of Science. Um, and he has served in, uh, I'll only give you a number, a uh, few of his positions. He is the former Acting Secretary General and Director of Research for, for OPEC. Um, he has served as an advisor uh, to the uh, Kuwait National Nuclear Energy uh, Committee and a trustee of the American University of Kuwait. Uh, he has worked at the International Atomic Energy Agency at, in at UNESCO. Uh, he received his bachelor's at the uh, um, University of California at Berkeley in electrical engineering and his doctorate in nuclear engineering. Um, and uh, he has had a very uh, fascinating career uh, on almost every aspect of energy and therefore we feel very fortunate to have you here this afternoon and uh, you're going to talk to us about um, nuclear power options, which is an issue that was sort of very close to us these days. Well, thank you very much, uh, Henry, and uh, I am very fortunate to have this opportunity to share with you some of my thoughts on uh, what I'm sure is a topic of interest uh, currently, which is nuclear power in the Middle East. Uh, of course, I think uh, usually people, when they think of nuclear power in the Middle East, uh, Iran comes to mind. And, uh, and I will not spend much time about Iran, talking about Iran, but I will uh, try to address why uh, the Middle East in general and uh, the oil exporting countries in particular had been considering the nuclear power option, given the fact that uh, they are considered to be the energy uh, sort of uh, storehouse of the world. For that matter, I will talk about a, a number of issues. Uh, I'll talk about the, the global and regional context, uh, the global context of nuclear power and regional context that is one of the main drivers for considering that option. I will talk about the other drivers, and then I will talk a little bit about alternatives uh, to nuclear power that uh, are or should be considered, and then I'll have some concluding remarks as you can see, and I'll try to cover all of this, what, in about 40 minutes? Sure. Is that something? I'm going to leave time for questions. Yeah, I would like to leave as much time to questions as possible. I think all of you know that before Fukushima, the world was talking about a nuclear renaissance. And I borrowed this slide from the IEA that shows the renaissance happening right here. Uh, and then, of course, Fukushima <coughs> happened, and the renaissance at least uh, disappeared or postponed. We see very little construction taking place after that. Uh, I think uh, Fukushima is sort of a watershed. I think uh, we, 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 we know what happened. We, we have drawn some lessons from it. As far as I'm concerned, uh, I think uh, it's clear to me that uh, Fukushima essentially is a man-made event. Uh, it could have been preventable. And uh, it happened because of a number of violations in particular violations to simple IEA safety guidances that were not really followed. Uh, having said that, I think the impact uh, is, has been tremendous in terms of material impact, uh, impact on the economy of Japan. But despite the magnitude of the ra radioactive release, which is about 10% of what was released in Chernobyl, uh, <coughs> we know that there are no prompt fatalities or delayed radiological public health effects that has occurred so far, and probably, probably, I say probably because still needs to be done, and Richard knows more about it. Uh, probably the only impact on the public health is, is calculable, but not measurable. That is, it will not be uh, 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 visible above background in terms of increased cancer in incidences. Well, only radiation impact. I would argue the much bigger public health impact will be from stress and evacuation. Yes, and yes, all that that, that's, that's, that's I agree with. I'm talking about the radiological impact. And yet, despite that, several mm -hmm. advanced countries and some emerging countries have canceled or reduced their nuclear power programs in the future. And this has an impact in the Middle East, no doubt. And so this is the reason I wanted to <coughs> just set the record straight here 
to start. Now let me move to the regional context. Uh, well, before I go to the regional context, the Fukushima impact has been to reduce the projected or the forecasted nuclear power expansion. These slides are taken last November from the IEA, and they show the forecast of nuclear power through 2030 has come down over the last two years. It's the last two, you know, could see it's come down. This is the low projection, and they have a high projection where it also shows significance coming down. But still, an increase from the current thing. So overall, there has been an impact in terms of reducing the projected nuclear power, and this would also impact the Middle East. In terms of the regional context, it's basically, and it's specifically for the oil-producing countries, it's basically the unsustainable <coughs> path on which these countries are following insofar as securing domestic energy supplies and to meet the demand that is rising at a very high rate. You know. One thing that's characteristics in the Middle East of the oil producing countries, oil exporting countries in particular, is that supported by the rent from the oil exports, these countries have put in place a system of a welfare state where citizens have become accustomed to receiving the benefits of the rent and they consider it to be an entitlement. And that has led to high growth rates in terms of population, GDP, energy consumption, water consumption. If I just remind ourselves that the Middle East is really, there is OPEC which is mostly the Middle East in terms of proven oil reserves and this is the gas reserves. And more importantly, in terms of the ultimately recoverable resources, which is much more than the proven resource, you could see, uh, if you focus on the dark yellow, forget about the other ones, you could talk about, you know, recoverable oil re resources would be much, much higher coming out from the Middle East. Now, this has led to, as I said, to huge, large energy demand growth rates, population growth rates, and so on. If you look at the energy, oops, I don't know why what happened. I lost it for some reason. I must have picked up the wrong. <laughs> this is, uh, well, anyway, uh, the point here is that we've been running at about 6 to 8 percent energy growth rate in terms of consumption. And that's really uh, unsustainable if it continues. Uh, per capita, we are one of the highest in the world, whether we're talking about total primary energy, whether you talk gasoline, whether you talk about electricity, and so on. And part of that reason is the welfare state, where the state is basically subsidizes energy. Essentially, energy is almost free, at least for the citizens. And even for the expatriates, energy is being sold in most of these countries at essentially very little, maybe 5-10% on average of uh, you could see this thing uh, in terms of per capita subsidies in, uh, in most most of the Middle East countries. You could see Kuwait, UAE, Qatar, Saudi Arabia. And this is how much subsidy the states are providing for each citizen. In Kuwait, one of the highest, over $2,500. And in terms of country, you could see, uh, again, you know, Iran, Saudi Arabia are on the top in terms of uh, subsidy value. So you could look at the, the subsidy in a different way, the cost versus the price, and take the case of Kuwait over the years. The cost has risen sharply, and mostly because of manpower and operation, and also partly because of the, you know, the price of gas and oil products are being charged at a certain index related to the international prices. But the but, uh, price of electricity has not changed, essentially. And, and you could see, in fact, what happened historically is that uh, the tariff, if anything, in Kuwait and Saudi Arabia, uh, they have come down, if anything, over the years. <coughs> and this is part of the welfare society. And so it's become very sort of expected. And uh, if, if something is done, there will be uh, rebellion, there will be chaos. And nothing of that sort is going to take place during the Arab Spring or Arab Summer or Arab Fall or whatever it is that's being characterized what's happening in the Middle East over the last few years. It's just to give you another look at it. Uh, this is from Jim Crane from Cambridge. He, he basically looked at it in terms of the, the household uh, comparing the UAE and the U.S. Uh, household consumption. 
in terms of kilowatt hours, uh, you could see it's almost seven times, and yet in terms <coughs> of the average bill, it's essentially less in the UAE than in the United States, and this is the more or less similar between the UAE citizens and the expatriates. So that's, that's really what characterizes these countries. The other thing is that despite the fact that uh, the, the, the oil and gas reserves are large, in terms of gas, only few countries really have that gas available at will. Uh, in Kuwait, for example, Saudi Arabia, most of the uh, gas reserves are associated gas, at least the known ones. And that means that uh, they're already being committed 100%, and you cannot bring them up and down because they are in conjunction with oil production. And they've been more or less committed to other things, like in Kuwait, it's one-third industry, one-third uh, injection into the oil fields, one third to the power stations. So really these countries are keen on trying to find free gas, not associated gas, and they're having extreme difficulty. Only Qatar and Iran have free gas available, and it's not likely that we will be importing, most of these countries will be importing gas from Iran in the near future. And Qatar has put a moratorium, as you know, on gas export, and it's not likely that moratorium <coughs> is going to be lifted and when it's lifted they will be selling it at international prices currently they're hoping to get you know something what they sell to the Japanese or the Europeans at 12 and 14 dollars not American prices three or two dollars uh, so Iraq may be uh, maybe a sort of a, a player in the future because uh, Iraq has large uh, reserves that once they are you know developed they could could mean a lot to some of these countries that are hungry for gas and so what this has led to, this shortage of gas to many of these countries, have led them to use oil and oil product liquids in the power station. And that's really something that is not rational, because if you are exporting a very lo low cost product at the international market at very high prices, burning it dom domestically is depriving you from very huge rent that is supporting the welfare state. And it's it's, I remember what I said about the regional context of these oil producing countries is the welfare state it's it's one of the sort of cornerstones of stability in that region sharing the benefits whether equitably or not equitably but sharing the benefits is really the important thing so what what do we have here is that in many of these countries like look at Kuwait uh, the, 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 the blue is the gas and the, 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 the dark or the black is the oil and oil product and you could see that the gas is only one third or less than one third and therefore they are burning away a very valuable product and, and if this continues the same thing in Saudi Arabia it's, it's similar UAE is forecasting this is will happen because they are about at the limit and that's the reason they went to nuclear power I'll come to that now in other countries Qatar does not have that problem because they have the gas and they're sitting on it so essentially they just burn gas and this is the picture in the GCC. So the picture in GCC, when you when you integrate all of them, it's it's this is the picture. So that means uh, if 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 you forecast or project into the future, you see this picture. You see that dependency on gas to meet the rising demand that's five or seven percent is going to continue to increase unless you come up with something. And if you cannot come up with the gas, you're going to burn more and more of the liquid fuels that are very valuable. So that's really the the issue in, in those countries. Uh, uh, to dramatize it, I think Jim Crane has recently shown this slide and I liked it because it shows w the situation in Abu Dhabi and Abu Dhabi is one of the first countries that went, went nuclear. You could see that uh, by 2020 all of this column is requirement for additional gas for the power generation and of course they start to come down 2017 because that's when the first nuclear power plant is supposed to come online. So, but, but, but these light pink things, these are gas imports that have not been yet secured so far. So that, that's a dramatization of it. And if, if, if the region is only going to use gas, this is how much gas is going to be needed. And that may even produce a security issue for the region that's sitting on huge hydrocarbon <laughs> reserves that's feeding the world. So that's a kind of paradox for that region. So. Having said that, I think uh, the, the one thing I want to point out, for example, in the case of Saudi Arabia, this is a Chatham House study. Many of you, before I get to the Chatham House, this is just a, just a, a rundown of, 
of the domestic consumption at maximum total production for oil in these countries as it's projected to 2020. You could see countries like Saudi Arabia is, is really approaching uh, by 2020 close to, 40, close to 50 percent and uh, UAE could be r running close to 50 percent at that time. So that, that, th that's something worrying and of course it's going to deprive them of the national I of the income. Uh, this is the Chatham House study that I was referring to that was done on Saudi Arabia. It has certain assumption. It doesn't mean this is what happened. But it certainly it shows you that the domestic oil consumption will exceed, in a business as usual, will exceed the total production of oil in Saudi Arabia by 2040, close to 2040. I'm sure this is not happened. This is based on certain number of assumptions. But this is what have led the Saudi Arabians to consider the nuclear option very seriously having failed in finding enough gas in their attempt because they had this gas play going on for the last 10 years with the international oil companies and they have not really been very successful. So either they import gas at very international prices or they have to do something about it and I will come to that. So, uh, <coughs> which, you know, I, 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 the welfare state depends on the oil revenues. And, and this is, for example, uh, 2012 break-even oil prices to, to finance the budget. And this is the projections in the next few years. Break-even meaning no deficit? No deficit in the budget of the government. That's right. basically. And, and, and I, 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 I want to bring your attention to Kuwait. Actually, it's not 60. It's closer to 80. The reason it appears here 60 is because uh, they, they put in the revenues from the investment abroad and they don't take out the 10% for the next generation. You know, by law, Kuwait has to take right from the top 10% and put it in a special fund for the next generation. Norway takes 100%, puts it away. Kuwait takes 10%. And if you, if you factor these two uh, issues back, Kuwait break even becomes closer to 90 or 80%. So Kuwait is, is not really correct to show it at least. But anyway, if you start taking away more because of your power requirement and the need to burn oil, then you're gonna, the, your break-even point is going to be even higher than this, much higher than this, which will impact international oil prices because there will, OPEC will start coming into play in terms of <coughs> trying to secure that additional rent. Uh, uh, and and it's, it's really a very, very difficult point. So to me, all of this is really one of the main drivers. I don't know why I'm getting this slide here. So these are, you know, the, the, the main driver, what I mentioned, that points to alternatives, that you have to look for alternatives. One of the alternatives is a nuclear. That has been considered now for the last 10 years. And it's been considered because the economics of nuclear looked very attractive when you compare it to oil, not to gas. And since these countries, especially the oil exporters that are deprived of free gas, what, what, they're, what they're looking at in terms of comparison is to compare with the oil as a source of fuel rather than gas as a source of fuel. And nuclear looks very competitive. I'm sure many of you have done that, but we have done some work both in Kuwait and the Emirates. And here's a summary, and don't worry about the details here. Here's a summary of what we have found out. That if the average long-term price of imported <laughs> gas is less than $8, then nuclear does not make sense. If it's more than $8, then it's makes sense. If the long-term oil price remains below $50, then nuclear does not make sense. But since oil prices are not expected to be down to 50 on a long-term basis, then nuclear makes a lot of sense for these countries from an economic and financial point of view. If the overnight cost of nuclear power, if everything else is fixed as above, if it reaches above 8,000 per megawatt installed, then it becomes to be not so attractive. But remember, the Emirate got a very nice deal at $3,500 per megawatt install, kilowatt installed. So, we have a, you know, the Emirate may have got a discount, not the average in free market price. Probably free market price would have been around 5000 At least the competing uh, bids were around 5000 the Arriva and what have you. So, still we are far away from it. Very low demand growth. This is not likely given the welfare state. But if somehow these countries manage to control the demand growth instead of 5%, 1%, or even make it negative through a very strong 
energy conserving measure, then nuclear does not make sense anymore. This, the final thing is the discount rate. Uh, uh, if you fix everything as above like $5,000 per kilowatt installed and so on, but if you put the discount rate at 12%, then nuclear loses its attractiveness in that context. And that's not expected to happen, especially if the money is going to come primarily from the state. Because the discount rate for the state is not going to be 12%. It's, it's going to be much lower than even 5% or so, 3% or 2%. At least the economists, that's how they argue it. And I believe most of you here are more knowledgeable than me on, on this issue. So the critical determining factor whether nuclear makes sense or not in these countries is what is the long-term price of imported gas and how secure it is. Other than that, nuclear makes a lot of sense. If you believe that you can import for the next 30 or 40 years gas at around, let's say, 5 or 6 or $7 for the next 30 or 40 years, you're better off on pure economics to import the gas and avoid the nuclear. Just from that particular driver. And we projected some, some additional to test what happened after Fukushima, for example. We increased the cost of nuclear power by 30%, and it's still very attractive. It, the break-even point becomes $60, you know, not $50. What was, what was the base that you were increasing it from? Oh, we were base increasing it from about 5000 to increase it by 30%. You okay. know. We did a number of tests and what have you. And there's a comparison here with renewables. So you could see that, you know, uh, uh, the overnight uh, cost, uh, uh, you know, instead of being around four, we, we went all the way to 6000 And you could see that uh, with a combined uh, CCGT, uh, you start, you start at, at, at the price of oil uh, uh, that is prevailing currently, uh, then, <coughs> then nuclear still make a lot of sense. So that, that's just, just to show that even after Fukushima, because a lot of people started talking after Fukushima, you have to pay, put a premium on nuclear for safety measures and what have you. So the cost of capital cost will increase by 10, 15, 20 percent. Even if you increase it by 30 percent, nuclear continued to be uh, competitive with prices of oil under $70, 65, 70 dollars. Which again, most people these days believe that oil long-term oil prices for the next few decades will not be as low as 70. Who knows? But at least this is for planning purposes. This is a situation. Now, I, I, put, uh, I put M and H. M means medium uh, importance for that driver. H is, is high importance for that driver. That's subjective. That's my own judgment. I don't think it's qualitative much more than quantitative. I think the environmental concern, I put it as medium, and, and the environmental concern is again driven by the welfare state. We are the largest consumer of energy per capita, the fossil fuels, so obviously we are one of the largest emitters of CO2 per capita in the world. Although in terms of total population, small, doesn't matter, but I think per capita it's really very, very significant. And again, this is a consequence of the social welfare state or the social contract that I talked about. Energy security is important because if you're going to rely on importing gas for long term, you have to consider energy security as an issue, just like the U.S. for a long time was talking about importing oil as an energy security. So if you're going to commit yourself to importing large quantities from the, I don't know, from, from uh, Iran or from uh, Russia or, or Southeast Asia, then you run into energy security issue because these are voluminous supplies, not like nuclear. Nuclear, you can get a fuel load, uh, one or two fuel loads, and it will be sufficient for a few years and, and so on. So, but I, I give it only as a medium, and I'm not going to dwell on it. I think the other driver is sustainability. And one aspect of national su sustainability, which I gave it high, is that you know, you're sitting in a lot of surplus these days. And it's better off to invest that surplus in assets on the long term that solves your problem. And nuclear power could be one aspect for the states to use its surplus to, 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 to solve the problem on the, on, on the long term, rather than just kind of taking a, a, a low return on it, or maybe like what happened in 2008, 2009, losing uh, 30, 40, 50 percent of your assets. So a nuclear power plant is there. It, it solves a problem for you. It, 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 you know, uh, bonds or, 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 or what they call these securities, second derivative securities, 
are not so attractive in terms of uh, optimum use. So uh, I, I gave that a high priority. I think another another aspect is is, is transfer of advanced technology. And no doubt, if you, if, you imp if you import nuclear power, you can have a turnkey, so you, you don't really transfer a technology. But you transfer technology through services, through uh, uh, local components, and so on. I did not rank it very high. I ranked it low, at least over the medium term. I think probably 20, 30 years from now, nuclear technology becomes an important uh, not just in terms of human human resources, but also in terms of localized local component of the industry. But I didn't give it very high driver. I, I don't think it figures that much in making a decision at the present time in going nuclear or not. Finally, of course, the geostrategic issues, and that is, in my judgment, ranks medium to high, and maybe in some countries low. It ranks high in some countries like Saudi Arabia. Uh, Saudi Arabia, it, it, it must cons consider nuclear power uh, in, 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 in terms of geostrategic issue. If Iran knows nuclear peaceful, then Saudi Arabia has to know peaceful. If Iran is going to go uh, military, then Kuwait, uh, Saudi Arabia cannot sit idle on that. The same thing is Egypt. A country like Kuwait, the geostrategic issue does not figure out prominently. A small country that is already secured by alliances with the United States, France, and the Security Council it makes no difference whether, you know, Iran at the end gets a nuclear weapon. Kuwait would rely more on the alliances with the uh, UN Security Council and so on. So I think you will find a, 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 a spectrum of importance among the countries. I say Bahrain and Kuwait, it, it means nothing. Maybe Qatar, it means something to them and so on. Egypt, definitely. Uh, uh, Iraq, may not now, but maybe in the future and so on. So, uh, in a summary, these are the drivers that I have, you know, there may be other drivers. Now, having said that, let me just <coughs> quickly show you a map of the Middle East and where the nuclear program stand today. I put in red here boxes countries that are in transition. The GCC countries, I put them in blue. And in yellow, solid in, 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 in the box means there is only preliminary consideration for nuclear power. I put Israel here as preliminary because this is nothing really serious. And the countries that have plans to go nuclear in the light, and there are some targets, light blue, and countries that have started already in building infrastructure in dark green, and that's United Arab Emirates, Iran, and Jordan, and Turkey. Uh, Egypt, more or less, same, same, same thing. They have, they have the infrastructure. But I think because of the, what's happening in Egypt, it's not going to happen. Now, I have, I'm not going to go over this in detail. I'll just say a few words about it. Uh, I have tables about these countries. I, I think you all know about the UAE. I don't need to repeat the case of the UAE. They have already signed with the Koreans for four nuclear power plants. They've started site work in one of them, for one of them. They have set up <coughs> the infrastructure with the help of the IEA and with the international community. And they are proceeding rather seriously uh, and expect to have their first nuclear power plant operational around 2017. Uh, it may slip into 2018. The site is about 300 kilometers uh, <coughs> west of Abu Dhabi, close to the Saudi Arabian, uh, but still far away from the border with Saudi Arabia. Well, now, after Fukushima, they didn't change course. They just simply did what many countries did, did an assessment, made some refinement, and proceeded accordingly. So that, that's really what I call reasonable, rational behavior in contrast of the, some of the irrational behavior like Germany and maybe other countries. And I'll come to that later on if I have time. But uh, after their review, they, they continued. Uh, Kuwait did the other way around. Kuwait had a plan to go nuclear. I was in the committee. We signed a number of agreements. We planned for the first nuclear reactor to be on, on, online 2020. As soon as Fukushima happened, the program was canceled. And I always joke about it. I said, <coughs> the reason we, 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 we canceled it, you cannot blame us, is that because we love German technology. If you drive in Kuwait, we drive Mercedes, Audis, BMWs. And if the Germans cancel their nuclear power plants, we're not going to go against it. If we were if we were driving Renaults or, 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 or French cars, 
probably we still have an active nuclear power program. And that's on the light side, not on the serious side. The Saudi Arabians, I showed you their problem. Their problem probably are, is much w more serious than the United Arab Emirates, and they recognize that. And they're doing it as they do it, you know, slowly but surely. And they set up a couple of years ago uh, a special center called King Abdullah's Center for Atomic and Renewable Energy, and they gave it the authority to plan and implement their nuclear and renewable. And the plan right now is the, the unofficial official plan is to build 60 nuclear power plants, uh, but they have not yet given the final go ahead. But they have signed agreement, did studies, did they have sites, and, and so on. And it's going to be the largest nuclear pr power program in the region if it materializes. I, I was in Saudi Arabia just a couple of weeks ago, and I met the head of, who, who by, the, by the way, studied in Harvard Rich, with, with Richard Wilson, I believe, ha Hashem Yaman who had his PhD here at Harvard. He's the, he's the head of the, the center. And he tells me that they are going ahead. Now, the thing is that they are planning on nuclear and renewable at the same center. And they're planning on something like, I think, 17 gigawatt uh, nuclear and 40 gigawatt of solar capacity. I believe the, six, the, four, the 17 gigawatt nuclear capacity is more realistic for me than the 40 gigawatt electric solar. I think that's just a, 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 a unrealistic in the in the next two or three decades, in my judgment. Uh, Bahrain, I think uh, it's just a plan that was abandoned. <coughs> Oops, I missed something. I hope I can. How do I go back? Go back. The arrow. The arrow. Where? Yes? I think I missed Jordan. Let me say a few words about Jordan because I think that's the other important country. Jordan is a, in a very tight situation. They have no essentially oil and gas other than tight shale oil. And although that's promising, I think it's not going to come online in huge quantities for the next 10, 20 years. And there are environmental issues. And they have some reserves, uranium reserves, something 70,000 uh, tons or so. So one of the few countries in the Middle East that has. So they're banking on this dual play, you know, exploiting their uranium, financing their nuclear power plant. The problem with Jordan, they have, a, they have set up an infrastructure, they have an atomic energy commission, they have an independent safety authority, they, they've solicited bids, they have received, screened the bids to three, one of them is Canadian, one of them is joint uh, French, Japanese, at, uh, Atmia, 1000, and the third one is Russian. Russians are offering them good financing. The problem with the Jordanians, in addition to the financing, the problem is they have no sites that are reasonable. The site on the Gulf of Aqaba is very hazardous with earthquake and sitting uh, in a very hot spot. The site that I've selected is in the desert where they have some seawater, uh, wastewater retreatment plan financed by USAID, supposedly for agriculture. They want to divert it to the nuclear part of it to the nuclear power plant. They need to secure uh, acceptance of the Americans. Americans will insist on them signing the 123 agreement, and they are not so keen on signing the 123 agreement. So it's a very complicated. Uh, uh, I'll come at the end to what is the solution for the Jordanian. But Fukushima did not detract them as a government, but the, the strong public opposition after Fukushima, especially uh, uh, coming from the people around us. So the Jordanians are in a dilemma. I don't think they will meet their original plans. <coughs> but they're still determined in, 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 in coming through. Uh, Turkey, I don't think I need to tell you about Turkey. Uh, Turkey has a strong uh, p program. They have basically signed government-to-government -government agreement between Russia and Turkey to build the first four nuclear power plants. And Fukushima did not really affect them. Iran, you know all about Iran. They have, a, what the, they have the only nuclear power plant in operation in the Middle East, although that plant has run into troubles from a safety issue. It's been shut down twice over the last year. 
and it's because it's a it's a hybrid German <laughs> Russian <laughs> physical hybrid you know they had infrastructure built by the G Germans the civil work and what have you and uh, some equipment and, and then the Russians took over and, and they had to match and I think that's going to haunt them uh, and, and, and we are very concerned in the Gulf about the safety issue uh, of, of things of course it would have been better to start over yes I think in hindsight they should have done that I think uh, the, the, the more serious concerns we have in the Gulf about Iran is not the civil but the nuclear weapons program although the two are mixed up in the dialogue in the, in the, in the, in the narrative uh, other than that you really don't have any serious nuclear power programs in the Middle East right now Egypt is the only country that was about to sign a couple of years ago uh, but uh, because of the political turmoil they have uh, more or less on the shelf right now and I don't expect uh, Fukushima or no Fukushima I think it's the political instability of the country that's going to delay their program again another five years or so. Uh, Egypt should have been the first country to introduce nuclear power program. They have the manpower. They've, they've had nuclear establishment research reactors. They have hundreds of PhDs in nuclear power from the top universities in America and so on. But somehow they haven't been able to put their act together, whether through a dictatorship under Mubarak they were not able to do it. And under an unstable democracy they're not going to be able to do it until some stability occurs. So what I'm going to uh, now talk about, what about regional? And the GCC in, 19, uh, in 2006 or seven, in one of the summits, they decided on a regional program as one way of going about it. The, the problem with the regional is that it's a concept that is ill-defined. What do you mean by a regional nuclear power program? First of all, there is no precedent so far. We don't know. There are there, there's only precedent is where it is like a result of a divorce. You know, you had you had one country and then you <laughs> divorce and then you split or you decide on a joint program because of, you know it's like it's like managing your asset jointly if you run into a divorce. So this I think is one <laughs> country or two country two examples of that type of thing. Uh, I, I believe in Europe. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, so <laughs> what else, what, is, what do you mean by it? I mean, do you mean setting up a one atomic energy authority to promote it or one safety authority to license it? It's, it's not done. The IEA, when we asked the IEA to help us, they were looking for ways, but they couldn't come up. I mean, I was involved in that. If you look at the, what the Baltic countries are attempting to do, they're thinking about sort of going in together financially. Well, you have you have Poland, you, you have countries. Poland, and some 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 Baltic well, countries. Poland dropped out. Yeah, the the thing at the end of the day is that when you build a nuclear power plant, you build it physically in one country, right. and and therefore you have to license it in that country. Right. What remains after that is is simply the issue of financing on the one hand, and the second hand is that who benefits from the electricity that's produced, and that can be handled. That can be handled, and that's one aspect. The second aspect is. So is the example of France, for example, that they are selling uh, electricity to Belgium and to UK also. The, the, the other thing is that the nuclear fuel cycle, the front end and the back end, where you may be able to cooperate. You know, one country can build a nuclear power plant, but it's better to have the back end in another country if they are both benefiting of it. But that's going to be a long term negotiation, especially in countries that have no experience, no legal infrastructure and so on so that that program is really going nowhere uh, the only the only thing that I can see is that there will be some coordination on the front and the back end on the long term and bilateral agreement between one country and another and here I say <laughs> where the Saudi Arabia can play a pivotal role Saudi Arabia can be the, the core of a not necessarily a regional program but a multi bilateral programs Saudi Arabia and Kuwait where Kuwait will finance one of the power plants and benefit from some of the electricity. Bahrain can do the same thing. Yemen can benefit. Although Yemen doesn't have the money, but probably through for, uh, aid or something they can benefit. Jordan, it would be ideal solution for the site of Jordan. I talked to them. It, it, it's no doubt that the, the Saudi Arabians are going to build nuclear power plants. They're going to build them on the Gulf and on the Red Sea. And they're not going to build them in the desert. So on the Red Sea, they're going to be maybe 100, 200, 300 kilometers from the Jordanian border. 
it was not far away. The Jordanians would be happy to have a site there. They don't have to own it, but they could provide manpower because the Jordanians have a lot of manpower. They can provide uranium, <coughs> barter the uranium, and so on. So that may be the solution for the Jordanians. So you have Saudi Arabia sitting in the middle. If they go ahead with their 16 nuclear power plants, then they could have you know, these type of agreement. And that would be really <coughs> a much more ideal situation, a practical situation, than talking about a theoretical uh, that's been going on now for five, six, seven years and, and no progress in the regional program. So I, that's basically the message that I have here. I, am I going forward or backward? Okay. okay. I think there are, of course, in addition to the opportunities, there are challenges of how do you go about it in countries that don't have any infrastructure, legal, manpower, industry, and what have you. And I think I, 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 instead of spending too much time on this, I'll just point out that the UAE has done it relatively smartly. They've done a smart way of doing it. They relied heavily on international uh, skills, agreements, manpower, expertise, uh, IEA, transparency on the nuclear fuel cycle, and I think they've set a model for others to follow. Although not a perfect model, but at least it's a good model. That well, it's not that expensive. They got the reactors at three thousand five hundred dollars. No, I'm just saying, you know, the, what they're paying the various international. Yeah, that's true. That's true. That's true. It is expensive. It is, it is expensive. But uh, uh, let me see. I, I'll try to wrap up in about five ten minutes. So I leave time to question. I just want to touch about the alternative, and so. Now, most important thing is that to use the international nuclear industry expertise to establish your infrastructure, build your human resources, and ensure world missing an elder standards of safety, and then work on the nuclear fuel cycle. I like what they have done on the nuclear fuel cycle. You know, participating in the international fuel banks, uh, although Kuwait did the same, but Kuwait opted out from the whole thing. Uh, looking at regional and international repositories and what have you. So using the best available technologies rather than, you know, cutting corners and what have you, but as you said, at a price. What are the alternatives? Conservation and renewable. These are the only two alternatives available to these countries other than fossil fuels and their problem. Uh, quickly, <coughs> conservation has the highest potential because the waste is so high, okay? So you could, you could easily get 20% saving of demand, which is equivalent to 20% supply. Not very costly. It's costly to the individual, but not costly to the state, because the state is subsidizing 90%. So it can easily subsidize the conservation measures, and you get a win-win situation. The citizen would win. You know, the state could really win by buying the insulating material for a building code and giving it to the citizen for free, essentially, like they're giving them the electricity free. It will, it will benefit the, the state. They put the initial upfront cost, can be absorbed by the state since the state is subsidizing 90%, and that will be a win-win for the situation. Is, so some, what of that, is some of that happening? Uh, they're beginning to think about it. Uh, it's, it's moving very slowly. It, it's, it needs education both to the government and to the citizens. I've just been in Capsar in Saudi Arabia where they have a study center and on the board. They're beginning to think about these things. We proposed it in Kuwait for the last 10 years and the government likes it, but the, but the friction between the government and the parliament uh, is dogmatic, not rational. Therefore, nobody is listening and, and, and so on. But it will be coming. I, I think it's coming. It came in Iran. Iran did it not on, like, well, did it on gasoline. They were very successful. They did a win-win situation. You know, in Kuwait, it cost the government per individual subsidy of about $2,500 a year, right? Half of that is not needed. Half of that electricity is not needed. So that's $1,200. You could tell the citizen, if you save a little bit, I'll give you half of what you save, cash. The other half is the country saves. So you have a win-win situation. And the citizen would love to have cash instead of electricity that he's burning with no use. You just keep the thermostat at uh, 70 degrees and travel abroad. So he's burning the oil that has been converted to electricity and the government is telling him, take as much as you want. So he takes as much as he can because he thinks it's his right. But it's really doing nothing for him. 
If, on the other hand, you tell him, I'll give you part of that cash, he will be very careful because the cash, he can travel, he can buy food, he can, you know, uh, take a vacation. The electricity, all what he can do is just turn it on. He's not making use of it. So that's really what, what's going to happen. The, the, the renewables, I'm not going to dwell on them. They've been offered as a, as a, as a, as a, you know, as a solution on their own. I don't think this is ri right. Uh, many people say in the Middle East that solar, if it's going to be successful, any place in the world is going to be in the Middle East. To a large extent, it's true, but it's not going to be much cheaper. It's not going to be much cheaper. And the same problems that inflict solar energy abroad is going to be more or less there. The issue of dilution, the issue of storage, the issue is that you don't really save capacity. You only save fuel, more or less. I mean, most of the most of the solar projects they don't eliminate capacity; they just simply save fuel, you know, by feed in and what have you. The same thing would be in the Middle East. Even if you, you know, Saudi Arabia talks about 40 gigawatt electricity, that's not going to be saving capacity. That's the capacity of the solar power plants that will be used part of the time in order to save fuel <coughs> at peak demand and so on. So these are really the issues of, of, of solar. I'm, I'm not going to go into the slides since I have uh, taken so much time. Let me conclude by saying uh, there is a, s in the MENA region, there is a strong case for nuclear option to be considered as part of a future power supply for some of the countries. I mean, really, Kuwait, the case of nuclear power in Kuwait is, is marginal because of the size of the country. I mean, we, when we did our studies, we couldn't find many sites. And any site, good site we found was within 20, 30 kilometers of the major population center. And I believe it would be safe, but the public are not going to buy that, especially after Fukushima. Okay. And Kuwait had a nuclear power program in 1975. I was part of it. And it was canceled after, uh, after Three Mile Island. So, you know, whenever you're going to have an incident, and you're going to have a nuclear <coughs> incident every 10, 15 years, major ones. But I think case of Kuwait, a small country, nuclear doesn't make sense to have it on its own. You could, you could benefit from it. Uh, and I, as I said, some drivers are more important and are not applicable uniformly. You know, like the driver of you know, the economics, the gas, and, you know, they don't apply uniformly to all of the countries. The, bar the barriers are challenging, but they are not insurmountable. They are some trouble. The UAE example is a good one. Uh, I think generally the, the Middle East response to Fukushima has been reasonable especially if you talk about the serious ones, Emirate and Saudi Arabia. Kuwait behaved rationally. I explained to you why. Egypt and Jordan may be next after UAE and Saudi Arabia, uh, but depending <coughs> on Egypt, it's political stability, and Jordan is, is financial. And uh, the momentum is slowing things down. I don't believe we're going to have even 15 megawatts. It used to be 30 megawatts by 2030 in the Middle East. I don't think we're going to make even 50 gigawatts. So that's that's so much. And I, I, although energy conservation and renewables are part of the optimal energy solutions with the largest extrinsic benefit, I think the MENA governments are facing major technical, societal, national uh, coordination challenges to implement these alternatives. And one has to keep in mind these alternatives on their own are not a solution, but they could contribute to the solution. I think I'll stop here, Henry. Okay, thank you. So uh, please join me in thanking thank Hadnan. Thank you.